So, but you're also, lest I forget to mention, you've also mentored some of the biggest names of computer vision, yeah. computer science, and AI today. Uh, there's so many questions I could ask, but really is what what is it, how did you do it? What does it take to be a good mentor? What does it take to be a good guide? Yeah, I I think what I feel, I've been lucky to have had very, very uh, smart and hardworking and creative students. I think some part of the credit just belongs to being at Berkeley. I think <laughs> those of us who are at top universities are blessed because we have uh, very, very smart and capable students coming on, knocking on our door. So, so I have to be humble enough to acknowledge that. But what have I added? I think I have added something. What I have added is, uh, I think what I've always tried to teach them is a sense of picking the right problems. Mm. So uh, uh, I think that in science, in the short run, success is always based on technical competence. You're, you know, you're quick with math or you are whatever. I mean, th there's certain technical capabilities which make for short range progress. Long range progress is really determined by asking the right questions and focusing on the right problems. And I feel that what I've been able to bring to the table in terms of advising these students is uh, some sense of taste of what are good problems, what are problems that are worth attacking now as opposed to waiting 10 years. What's a good problem? If you could summarize, if is that possible to even summarize? Like, what, yes. what, what's your sense of a good problem? I, I think, uh, I think uh, I have a sense of what is a good problem, which is uh, there is a, a British scientist, uh, in fact, he won a Nobel Prize, uh, Peter Medover, who has uh, a book on, on this. And uh, basically, he calls it the research is the art of the soluble. So we need to f sort of find problems which are which are not yet solved, but which are approachable. And he sort of refers to this sense that there is this problem which isn't quite solved yet, but it has a soft underbelly. <laughs> there is some yeah. place where you can, you know, spear the beast. <laughs> yes. And having that intuition that this problem is ripe is, is a good thing because otherwise you can just beat your head and not make progress. So I think that is that is important. So if if I have that and if I can convey that to students, it's not just that they do great research while they're working with me, but that they continue to do great research. So in a sense, I'm proud of my students and their achievements and their great research even 20 years after they've ceased being my student. So it's in part developing, helping them develop that sense that a problem is not yet solved, but it's solvable. Correct. The other thing which I have, uh, which I, I think I bring to the table uh, is, uh, is uh, a certain uh, intellectual breadth. I, I've spent a fair amount of time studying psychology, neuroscience, relevant areas of applied math and so forth. So I can probably help them see some connections to disparate things which uh, uh, they might not have otherwise. So, uh, so the smart students coming into Berkeley can be very uh, deep in the sense, uh, they can think very deeply, meaning very hard down one particular path. But uh, where I could help them is the, the shallow breadth, but uh, <laughs> the where, whereas they would have the, the narrow depth and uh, but that's that's of some value. Well, it was beautifully refreshing just to hear you naturally jump to psychology, back to computer science in this conversation, back and forth. I mean that that's a it's a, a rare quality, and I think it's certainly for students empowering to think about problems in a new way.